we are live good evening and welcome everybody to the i focus online classes today we are on the episode 395 and the ninth episode of cataract module and i have with us our uh, chairperson dr paresh vaidya sir who is a senior cataract consultant at center for sight eye hospital at surat and our speaker for today is dr jaita bose who is working currently at center for sight eye hospital in new delhi the topic for today's class is premium eye wells when and why so cataract surgery as we all know is something which is the bread and butter for every ophthalmologist and premium eye wells is something that you need to be aware for counseling every patient for cataract surgery so uh, coming to the introduction of our speaker dr jaita bose has done her mbbs and ms in ophthalmology from amu aligarh hospital following which she has pursued her fellowship in cornea and anterior segment from the prestigious lvpi hospital currently she is a senior consultant at center for sight eye hospital in new delhi she has also been associated as a consultant at lvpi lakshmi eye hospital venu eye hospital and iq delhi uh she has also been awarded a prestigious award like the president abdul hamid international award for uh, so for her services in community of the mall uh, community of the mall society she is a member of dos and aios and has presented talks at various national conferences and was an invited faculty for training surgeons and eye bank technicians at lagos in nigeria and in dhaka at bangladesh on behalf of the international federation of eye and tissue banks So I welcome our chairperson, Dr. Paresh Sir, and our speaker, Dr. Jayita Bose, along with which we have two uh, two uh, hot seat contestants, uh, Dr. Anmol Kar and Dr. Shreya, who have also joined us for our live discussions at the end of the session. I hand over the uh, um, uh, the session to Dr. Paresh to further mod um, hand carry on the session, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, i think so uh, uh, this is a very interesting topic uh, in the present scenario of a cataract surgery as we know that um, the evolution of the cataract surgery right from the intra capsular cataract extraction to the now phaco and coming to the femto cataract surgery uh, when we are doing a, such a excellent cataract surgeries and uh, all the surgeons are doing a, such a beautiful cataract surgeries nowadays with a very skillful surgeries uh to give a <clears throat> excellent results uh, uh we must have a very good tool with us and that what we uh, are now uh, opting with a, a beautiful uh, premium eye wells so uh, uh, we have a, a lot of uh, premium eye wells with us and sometimes it is very confusing to us also that which one to choose and when and why to why why we should choose this one sometimes it is also very difficult for us to say no to the patient and yes to the patient so i think so uh, dr jaita uh, will discuss this in very detail theoretically as well as we will discuss some practical points uh, and also we will discuss that which are the some peculiarities of the uh, some of the lenses which are now available as well as uh, the coming up the lenses with uh, uh, all different uh, trajectories and all delivery systems so uh, i uh, hand over this uh, uh, talk to the uh, dr jaita and uh, please dr jaita you can uh, carry on with this your with the talk yeah uh, thank you uh, dr pranita and dr paresh uh, for your introduction and uh, <clears throat> uh, as we all know this is a really important topic now and even in the future so you know without any uh, further delay let's just dive into this topic about premium eye wells when and why okay so uh, the overview of the presentation is we'll be talking about what is the ideal eye well what are the materials and designs indications and contraindications types and the commonly used premium eye wells and what is the future of premium eye wells uh, <clears throat> the ideal intraocular lens should restore the patient's vision without complications or visual compromises at all distances a premium eye well includes multifocal accommodative eye wells which provide clear vision at near and distant focal points without additional spectacle correction and toric eye wells for astigmatism correction premium eye well technology refers to eye well uh, biome biomaterial aesthetic designs and special refractive properties so we will be discussing multifocal accommodative trifocal edof toric 
trifocals and uh, iovals of the future in this presentation. So in spite of, uh, you know, our best efforts, there may be still some points which are, because it's a very big topic, so some points may be overlooked. So uh, I would request uh, our moderator and our chairman to, you know, add to the discussion at the end of the talk. So the brief history of IOLs. Uh, the first successful intraocular lens was implanted in 1949 uh, by Sir Harold Ridley. And, uh, and gradually there has been a huge evolution in the materials, in the design, and uh, in the different types of IOLs. The first foldable IOL was a plate haptic lens. Uh, it was implanted in uh, 1978 by Mazzocco. And in, at the same time, the, in uh, 1998, the star uh, company, they introduced silicon toric IOL, which was the first toric IOL. The first multifocal IOL was uh, introduced by Johnson & Johnson, AMO array. And uh, following that, there was a first uh, uh, accommodating IOL, which was crystal lens. And then the Acrisoft Restore, which is the first diffractive multifocal IOL. And then the Technis Symphony, which was the first EDOF IOL, followed by uh, 2017, the RX site, which is the first light adjustable IOL. And when we talk about the history of cataract surgery, uh, we cannot, uh, you know, not mention these uh, two people who were responsible and who were, I would say, you know, uh, uh, had great vision and foresight when they uh, introduced IOLs and FECO emulsification. Sir Harold Ridley who was the first person to put an IOL. And incidentally, he actually put the IOL in the bag. Later on, it was uh, the IOL from the bag. It was uh, put in the AC and then the sulcus. And now we know that by default, all IOLs are put in the bag. So... Uh, Harold Ridley performed the first intraocular lens surgery in November 1949, and uh, so many changes have taken place. But the basic, uh, you know, vision which he had, which is that putting an IOL in its physiological position, that is inside the capsular bag, is still relevant even today. The modern era of cataract surgery, of course, started with the introduction of phaco emulsification in 1967 by Dr. Charles Kellman. And then uh, different new uh, materials are now being used, like hydrophobic acrylic, hydrophilic acrylic, silicon, PMMA. Uh, and there are, of course, some materials which will be coming in the future. Now, the biomaterial used for premium IOL should ensure that the uh, IOL has a long-term biocompatibility with the uvia as well as with the capsular bag. And this is determined by the relationship of the IOL with the residual lens epithelial cells within the capsular bag. So the different IOL materials show different adhesive properties. For example, the hydrophobic acrylic materials present the highest level of adhesiveness. And it is also expected that when after the IOL has been implanted, the anterior and posterior capsule should fuse with the IOL and prevent its decentration or rotation. Now, uh, coming to the structure of the IOLs, we know that the IOL optic, uh, most of the IOLs which we are using these days, they have uh, optic has a square edge. So this square edge minimizes PCO by reducing the migration of lens epithelial cells, but there is a slight risk of dysphotopsia. Then the round edge IOLs, which are no longer used these days, they're quite rare. They have less dysphotopsias, but they have a higher rate of PCOs. Most optics are biconvex and as the IOLs have, uh, you know, become more and more advanced, the size of the optic has increased and now more, most of the optics are in the range of 6 to 6.5 millimeters. The multifocal lenses, we know they use a diffractive uh, kind of uh, structure, diffractive convergence, and the extended depth of focus or EDOF lenses use a diffractive optics to create an elong elongated focal points. The haptic also these days has a square edge, which is better for the bag and reduces the PCO risk. Now, three-piece IOLs, of course, are not used that much these days, but uh, they are made of PMMA. And uh, some of the examples are MA60 and soft coat. And uh, another material which is used in uh, CT Lucia lenses is uh, PVDF. Most commonly, the material which is used is acrylic. Silicon material is not used because of the risk of uh, interaction with the silicon oil, which is used in retinal surgeries. Uh, the properties of IOL materials, we know that the most commonly used materials these days are hydrophilic acrylic and hydrophobic acrylic. So uh, both hydrophilic acrylic and hydrophobic acrylic, they are foldable soft materials. 
the hydrophilic acrylic is actually a very thin material. It has a low rate of inflammation, low aqueous flare, but we cannot really change its uh, shape design much. And uh, it's difficult to have a square edge in this kind of IOL. And there is a high rate of PCO also. But these lenses are easy to handle. And the only dis uh, disadvantage is that they have a quite a high rate of PCO. And also there is a long-term IOL opacification. The hydrophobic acrylic has a low rate of PCO. It is quite a tacky uh, surface. It has a high refractive index, but there is more chances of uh, inflammation in the eye with the help of this edge. But in these lenses, we can have a sharp edge design. Uh, apart from this, we also have some newer uh, biomaterials. Uh, for example, the injectable IOLs. In the injectable IOLs, uh, the IOL is injected into the capsular bag. It is a liquid material. Uh, this is injected to the capsular bag and then it is uh, transformed into a solid. So this liquid material, of course, this is still in the stage of research. It is not really commercially available, but in the future, this may be an option for surgeons. So this material has to have a good biocompatibility. It should be non-toxic and it should be able to maintain a transparent state and have sufficient refractive power. So when we are turning this liquid into a solid material, some external stimulation is required uh, in the form of heat or ultraviolet radiation. And uh, the this external force, which is converting the liquid into a solid, can cause some eye damage. So that is the major drawback uh, in this kind of IOL. But of course, uh, research is still taking place in, these, uh, in this IOL. Then... Uh, we have a certain IOL surface modification. So this is something very interesting. Uh, we know that the IOL surface uh, attracts inflammatory cells, attracts lens epithelial cells, and it also attracts bacteria. So if we modify the surface of the IOL by using certain cell apoptotic drugs like doxorubicin and anti-proliferative drugs like paclitaxel and even laser-activated anthocyanin green, these three things have been shown to inhibit the lens epithelial cell proliferation and migration and reduce PCO. Then another very interesting advancement is the uh, prevention of endophthalmitis using a drug carrying IOL. Uh, so moxifloxacin, which is a broad spectrum uh, fluoroquinolol is often used as a, pre a prevention for endophthalmitis after cataract surgery. And studies done by Pimenta et al, they have shown that uh, they have uh, you know, grafted this uh, compound called SBMA or AMPS. Uh, with the help of argon laser assisted co-polymerization. Basically, they have made a polymer and they have you know, grafted it on the lens. And inside this polymer, they have kept uh, molecules of uh, moxifloxacin, which will be re released in a sustained uh, fashion inside the eye. And it will uh, be a kind of a, a prophylaxis against uh, surgical endophthalmitis. So if, even up to 12 days, this moxifloxacin will be released in the eye. So uh, this is one very exciting and new advancement. And then there is something called biosensing technology. So uh, the IOL can sense uh, uh, or it can be used as a sensing device and detect special biomolecules in the environment of the eye, specifically inflammatory uh, molecules like MMP9 uh, can be uh, detected. And the IOL can also monitor the intraocular pressure and glucose concentration inside the aqueous. Uh, now the IOL design. We know that traditionally the IOLs had a spherical design and spherical designs can uh, bring about spherical aberrations uh, because the rays of light which are uh, being uh, refracted from the periphery of the lens and the center of the lens, uh, they may not reach the same focus. And aspheric IOLs match more closely to the shape and quality of the human lens. So aspheric IOLs are also considered to be premium IOLs, though I think most of the IOLs these days are uh, aspheric IOLs. Then the size of the IOL is also important because we have seen that uh, with advancement, the size has been, the optic size has become larger. And this is also important, uh, especially in toric IOLs and in multifocal IOLs, uh, which they have an overall large diameter, which means that the lens remains in the same position in which it is implanted and it doesn't rotate in the bag. And it is nicely covered by the anterior capsular axis. Now, uh, we know that uh, with age, there is senile meiosis, and this senile meiosis actually reduces some amount of the uh, aberrations, and uh, patients who have senile meiosis, they don't have so much of spherical aberrations. So, aspheric IOLs uh, would specifically benefit patients who do a lot of contrast-dependent tasks like night driving uh, in mesopic conditions. 
also younger patients who are getting cataract surgery like patients with congenital cataracts patients who are getting refractive lens exchange and who have larger pupil size are more likely to experience aberrations so they will benefit with a uh, aspheric iol but a contraindication for aspheric iols is patients who have undergone hyperopic uh, laser refractive correction because these patients often have a negative corneal uh, spherical aberration and an aspheric lens uh, would magnify this problem so this is the spherical uh, uh, sphericity of different iols and uh, we have seen that if you compare uh, spherical and aspheric iols there is significantly lesser uh, spher uh, spherical aberration in eyes with an aspheric iol and um, in cause the spherical iols increase the ocular spherical aberration especially at larger pupil diameters and high contrast uh, bcv however is not significantly uh, improved by implanting an aspheric iol so the uh, snell's visual acuity may be the same in both aspheric as well as spherical iols but in specific conditions mesopic and scotopic conditions the performance of the aspheric iol will be better but one advantage of spherical aberrations is increased ocular is increased depth of focus and this principle has been used in the edof lenses so this is a possible benefit of the spherical aberrations now if you see the different uh, lenses here all of them have a negative spherical aberration except the bosch and lomb lenses which have a zero spherical aberration zero uh, sphericity uh, then we come to another function or another uh, you know uh, method by which we can evaluate the performance of a lens which is known as the mtf or modulation transfer function so the mtf uh, provides a qualitative and standardized way to characterize optical systems it measures a lens's ability to transfer the contrast of an of a sample to an image using spatial frequency or resolution the spatial frequency indicates the number of line pairs that means there is one black and white one white line per millimeter and there are uh, different charts with equally spaced alternating black and white lines which are used to measure the mtf of a lens Uh, so we have this uh, we can we can basically compare the performance of different lenses using this mtf chart and uh, this is uh, you know uh, on the x axis we usually have uh, the spatial frequency which is measured in lines per millimeter and uh, on the y axis we have the modulation transfer so if you see uh, the if you compare uh, different iols like in this uh, chart on the right side you can see there are three different mtf uh, graphs of three different iols the monofocal iol shows uh, a very high uh, curve at one point and then it decreases suddenly the multifocal shows a number of peaks and then troughs so that means these correspond to the rings or the diffraction gratings of the multifocal iols whereas the edof lens shows a kind of a uh, you know prolonged or a long uh, extended uh, focus which is intermediate between the multifocal and the monofocal lenses so this is another way in which we can compare the lens uh, performance another concept of uh, iol uh, uh, you know structure is the apodization of the iols we know that diffractive iols uh, have gratings or steps and apodization modifies the step height so that the steps gradually reduce towards zero as as the uh, towards the periphery of the lens so the steps in the center are higher and as we move towards the periphery the steps become lower so this is done because the lower step uh, shifts energy from the near foci to the distance foci and the energy becomes more biased towards distance for larger pupil size so the logic behind it is that uh, when the, when there is bright condition the pupil size is small and both distance and near vision is required but under darkened conditions the pupil size expands and people don't really need to have good near vision because they are not expected to do any near work in darkness they require distance vision so that is why uh, the light is kind of shifted towards the distance focus so there is a good distance vision uh, which is very important in case of uh, multifocal iols in uh, patients uh, who are doing like night work like driving or any any kind of walking in the dark so any any kind of activity which requires distance vision in the dark then we come to the most important thing which is the uh, patient selection so without a proper patient selection we will not be able to achieve a good uh, result in uh, premium iol section so patient selection counseling and uh, fit of the right lens to the right patient is very very important 
So nowadays we know that patients are already aware of uh, different premium IOLs and when a patient comes into the OPD, they will be asking us that, you know, we doctor, we want this lens. They, they will know the name of the lens also and they will say we want to put this lens in our eye. So this uh, is, uh, you know, that is why the doctor also has to be aware of all the different lenses. What are the advantages and disadvantages and which lens is good for which person? So first of all, the patient should be motivated and at the same time should understand that uh, premium IOLs have some limitations and they should also have realistic expectations. Then they should be told about the aberrations that there might be uh, some aberrations, especially if the person has a lot of uh, activity in darkness, it drives at night. And uh, some of these symptoms can be improved with neuroadaptation, but some of them may persist for a long time and some of them may even be permanent. Another thing is the uh, bilateral surgery. Binocular vision is very important for patients who are undergoing premium IOL. And in fact, many studies have also considered binocular vision. So if a patient uh, comes for a premium IOL, uh, it is, I think, uh, imperative that we should counsel the patient at, about both eye surgery. And it needs to be done within a period of one to two weeks to get the maximum benefit of this IOL. So a detailed preoperative history and examination is very important and we should specifically look for any pathologies which can give a less than optimal outcome in these patients, specifically corneal pathologies like dystrophies, pterygium, any corneal scars, dry eye of course is very very important, often uh, you know overlooked and not routinely done in clinics. So dry eye specifically we should look for dry eye syndrome and uh, meibomian land dysfunction because the patient will be very unhappy if uh, he gets a premium IOL and then he has severe dry eye. Then a patient who is quite tall, you know, he will uh, have a longer arm length and he will require more uh, vision at intermediate distance. So maybe EDOF lens is more suitable for such a person compared to a shorter person who will have a shorter arm length and will be more happy with the multifocal, which, which will give him better vision for a shorter distance. The preoperative refractive error like hyperopes generally will be more happy uh, getting a multifocal or a trifocal lens because uh, they will be free of glasses. Biopes are used to a very high quality of vision, so they may not be that happy, especially if they have a lot of visually demanding work. In a young patient, we must consider that this lens will remain in the patient's eye for the next uh, 30 or 40 years and uh, whether this material is suitable for his eye and whether there may be any condition which can deteriorate his vision like future retinal problems, eye well dislocations, etc. The angle kappa is also very important because uh, if the patient has a high uh, angle kappa, then uh, he will have more glare and halos and a decentration of the eye well will produce uh, more photic phenomena in uh, cases with the large angle kappa. Um, then any condition which causes a decentration or rotation of the IOLs, either preoperatively or intraoperatively. This intraoperative is, again, it's a very tricky situation where we have planned a patient for a premium IOL, but we have an intraoperative complication where there is a zonular dialysis or there is a PC rent. So in th that case, it is very difficult to decide whether to put a, intra a, a, a you know, premium IOL and also more difficult to explain to the patient why this was not put. So in, if we already, uh, you know, preoperatively uh, see that there are some conditions uh, like pseudo exfoliation, trauma, so definitely don't counsel the patient for a, uh, a premium IOL. And, uh, uh, and tell the patient why this uh, IOL is not suitable for him. Then uh, good fundus examination, look for retinal diseases, especially progressive retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa. Many patients of retinitis pigmentosa are young, they will come with cataracts. And then you see the fundus and you will find that they'll have all these signs of retinitis pigmentosa and very pale discs. And uh, patients of amblyopia, again, uh, we don't know how much the vision will improve and uh, how much of the vision loss is due to cataract and how much is due to amblyopia. Then uh, patients who have got previous ocular surgery, especially refractive surgeries, again, uh, patients who have undergone RK, these patients are very tricky because uh, there may be an IOL power miscalculation and there might be increase in the aberrations of the eye. So they may not, uh, you know, be very satisfied with the quality of vision. Again, they should be counseled very well before taking up for surgery. Uh, any op macular and optic nerve head disease. Uh, will be a contraindication, especially advanced ARMD, diabetic maculopathy, uh, any glaucoma patient, uh, only glaucoma suspects and ocular hypertensives with no disc or field damage uh, with explained prognosis can be taken up for multifocal and uh, premium IOLs. Uh, 
nowadays for every patient we do a preoperative OCT and uh, uh, we, that will help us to you know detect conditions which are not seen clinically any occult pathology uh, in case of such pathologies then definitely we should not go ahead for a multifocal IOL and also conditions where we expect that the media visualization will be impaired after a multifocal IOL uh, in that case also we should uh, you know restrain from this multifocal and trifocals uh, these patients, we can provide a monofocal monovision uh, because um, that will help the patient to achieve some amount of spectacle independence and definitely counsel the patients for this option as well. What are the post-operative complications which we may encounter? Uh, most commonly, a residual refractive error can be there due to some inaccuracy in biometry, uh, in error in the IOL positioning. So we must also counsel the patient that sometimes if the patient is not happy with the vision and not willing to wear glasses, they may need uh, contact lenses, surgical intervention in the form of LASIK, IOL exchange, or a piggyback IOL. A PCO is very common, especially in, uh, you know, multifocal IOLs. If you are, we are using a hydrophilic material IOL in young patients, it leads to a loss of contrast, glare. And uh, we are very tempted to do an early YAG cap. But remember that uh, sometimes by doing a YAG cap, we can also, uh, you know, uh, compromise the stability of the lens. Uh, toric lens can rotate. And then in case a patient needs a... IOL explantation, then it is it becomes very difficult if the patient has been yagged. Um, so halos and glare, we know these are very common uh, complaints. Now this is a IOL um, selection flow chart. Of course, this is not you know uh, applicable to all patients, but this is a kind of guide which you we can use and uh, we can guide our patients. So if a patient uh, you know wants spectacle independence and he wants full time spectacle independence, he is he is, has a healthy eye. He wants near more of near. He is tolerant to glare. Go for a trifocal IOL. If he is uh, intolerant to glare, then go for a EDOF IOL. If a patient is has more work in the distance and intermediate, not so keen, not so much work in uh, near, then go for a non diffractive EDOF IOL. Also, if a patient has some retinal pathology or query may develop some retinal pathology in future, go for a non diffractive EDOF IOL. If a patient has, uh, you know, uh, previously used monovision, then you can counsel this patient for monovision. If a patient is a very particular and a fussy patient, uh, then uh, you must uh, go for a light adjustable lens, which can be later on, we'll come to that also, which can be, uh, you know, tailored to the particular refractive error of the patient. If a patient is easygoing and myopic and the patient uh, removes his glasses to read, then we can use give him a monofocal uh, glass for near, uh, you know, slightly adjusted for near vision and uh, he can use uh, some glasses for distance and if a patient is used to uh, you wearing his glasses for reading then we correct him for distance and uh, give him glasses for near so these are uh, some of the guidelines you know this is not an absolute guideline but maybe this could be some sort of a guideline for uh, decision making in these conditions now we come to some of the uh, premium lenses starting with the crystal lens which is again which has become a historical lens now because it is no longer used but uh, i have seen crystal lens being used and we might encounter some crystal lens complication that is why it's important to at least know that this is a lens which was uh, the first accommodative lens and it was the first fd approved accommodating lens it was introduced in 2003 and several versions of this lens have been introduced uh, by Bosch and Lom. And uh, so this lens is actually a silicon lens. It is a posterior chamber lens. Now the haptics are very unusual. There are plate haptics and these haptics are hinged. So there is a kind of thin area where the hinges are there. And at the end of the haptic, there is a uh, loop, a polyamide loop. So uh, this uh, the size of the lens is 10.5. Diagonal length is 11.5. Refractive index is 1.43. The overall diameter is a little higher than the capsular bag. So this means that the lens assumes a little posterior position after implantation. And uh, what happens is that this, because the lens has a kind of a, uh, the optic is slightly posterior to the haptics, the lens can move with accommodation the and it can kind of bring about some uh, uh, pseudo accommodation. It can give you some amount of vision for reading and intermediate distance. But the amount of uh, accommodation uh, has been only one adapter and that too, it is not really proven how much uh, accommodation was actually provided by this. And it has one important complication of crystal lens is the Z syndrome. 
this was first reported uh, by Kazal et al. And what happens is that there is a sudden uh, decrease in the UCV and BCV and a high degree of astigmatism. So when we look at the slit lamp, we see a kind of a tilt in the lens and anterior subluxation of one hinge and posterior displacement of the second hinge of the other hinge. And the anterior hinge comes into contact with the posterior iris pigment, causing chaffing and uh, pigment dispersion. So and it assumes the shape of a Z. So uh, this is happening because of capsular fibrosis and contraction. And the treatment is by doing NDAG uh, uh, posterior capsulotomy. But even after NDAG, some, sometimes the lens may not come back to the correct position. Now, other accommodating lenses have also been developed, but they're not really much in use. So uh, just for theoretical interest, we should at least know the names of these lenses. One is uh, one CU lens, uh, which has a haptic which has a um, biconvex uh, acrylic uh, square-edged optic and there are four haptics which are hinged. So the hinges are important because they can keep moving the optic up and down. And the other one is a tetraflex lens, which is also, uh, which has a unique design and it is a, like a plate haptic lens. Then there is another uh, uh, opt, uh, this, uh, accommodating lens, which is called the synchrony lens, which is... Uh, uh, quite complicated. Even the mechanism is quite complicated. But basically, uh, I think we what for our um, students should at least know that there is such a lens which has two optics. So there are two, and there's an anterior optic and there's a posterior optic which are connected by means of haptics. And uh, initially, there is a kind of separation of the two optics, which uh, is in is made in such a way that they they are in emetropic state and with accommodation with the movement of the ciliary body and the zonules the uh, separation can be increased or decreased and some amount of accommodation can take place. So this is known as a dual optic lens. The lens looks quite bulky. So this, this is just for theoretical knowledge and I don't know if uh, anybody uh, if ever has been used or not. Uh, so now we come to the uh, refractive and diffractive multifocal eye wells. The refractive uh, multifocal eyewells were the first uh, multifocal eyewells which were started and they have annular or concentric ring-like zones of different dioptric powers. So the most important thing is that they are pupil dependent. With the change in the pupil diameter, the number of zones in use will vary. Hence, uh, the image quality will be dependent on the pupil and uh, with uh, large pupil, there may be a lot of glare and halos. Uh, diffractive eyewells, they, uh, they have steps. And they have microscopic steps, and each step has a specific phase delay, which is usually half a wavelength. So the light encountering these steps is directed equally between distance and near focal points for all pupil diameters. So these lenses are not pupil dependent. That is the major difference and the major advantage. So all the multifocal trifocals are mostly now on the diffractive platform. So the light energy, about 18%, is directed to higher diffraction orders. The remaining is distributed equally for distance and near about 41% each. In trifocals, there are three focal points and uh, which gives you some amount of intermediate vision as well. Um, so the diffractive multifocal eye wells, uh, they induce diffraction and they have con constructive interference at two or more foci. And uh, in the, the diffractive multifocal eye wells, the out of focus light is spread out very uniformly. So there is not much of glare and even if the glare is there it is less noticeable but in refractive multifocal eye wells the out of focus light is seen as rings which is uh, which may be quite uh, you know uncomfortable for the patient and so mostly now all the uh, eye wells are made on the diffractive platform so this is uh, some examples of refractive eye wells and you see that there are alternating rings for distance and near. And then there is one, uh, another eye wells which has a sector, there is a uh, distance sector and there is a near sector. Of course, these are not really used much anymore. There are these, there are, there is a transition zone uh, between the distance and the near, which is denoted by the horizontal lines. And then now we come to the EDOF lenses. So EDOF lenses are really, uh, uh, you know, things uh, uh, have really changed the, uh, cataract surgery of today, uh, the introduction of the EDOF lenses or extended range of vision. It is a new treatment in the uh, correct, uh, new technology in the treatment of presbyopia correcting lens. So the basic principle is to create a single elongated focal point, which will enhance the depth of focus, contrary to monofocal IOLs, which have a single point uh, focus or multifocals, which have two or three discrete points. So this elongated focus eliminates overlapping of near and far images and it eliminates the halo effect. 
and these lenses basically enhance intermediate and near uh, visual performance and the distance vision also remains good but for near and very small uh, print they may require a additional near add so these are some of the edof iols which are used and then there are pure edof iols which are only spherical aberration based and then there are some hybrid uh, mono, multifocal edof iols so the hybrid ones basically include technis synergy which is the one which we use quite com uh, you know commonly uh, the technis symphony these are all the um, hybrid multifocal edof iols the pure edof iol is ihans but even ihans these days is considered as an advanced monofocal and not a pure edof iol so like we see that most of these are actually made of hydrophobic material and they have the similar kind of uh, structure, the size of the IOL, the optic size, closed loops. Most of them have, they are very similar in their structure. So um, the EDOF IOLs that we have seen is basically they use the spherical aberrations and they improve the depth of focus, right? So another uh, way of in which they act is by using chromatic aberrations. So chromatic aberration is the uh, consequence of the focal length difference between the visible spectrum of different colors of light. And we know that uh, chromatic aberrations can be in induced by IOLs and it depends on the uh, different factors like the optical material, which is expressed by the Abbey number. So the Abbey number shows how much refractive index changes with the wavelength of light. The higher the dispersion, the smaller is the Abbey number. So the uh, a lens should have actually the a high Abbey number, which means there is less chromatic aberration and less dispersion of light. And the optical design also has an impact. So a refractive optic actually maintains chromatic aberration induced by the cornea and the total chromatic aberration will increase in a refractive optic whereas in a diffractive optic can reverse the chromatic aberration so it will minimize the chromatic aberration. Another way of uh, mechanism of action of EDOF is a pinhole effect. The pinhole effect uh, helps us to obtain a greater depth of focus. And this was uh, you know, presented by Campbell many years back when he said that increasing the pupil size uh, will, in will decrease the depth of the field and the depth of focus. So that is why some of these IOLs, they have an opaque pinhole-like structure in the center. And uh, the light which is entering the light near the center of the pupil will produce a greater photoreceptor response compared with the light entering the eye near the pupillary edge. So these are the, so like we have seen, there are pure EDOF IOLs and hybrid EDOF IOLs. And uh, uh, the hybrid EDOF IOLs can be categorized as diffractive EDOF IOLs, refractive EDOF IOLs, and diffractive refractive EDOF IOLs. The pure EDOF IOLs, should, will employ either spherical aberration based optics or pinhole effect. So the spherical aberration based EDOF IOLs, uh, they have an elongated focus. So there is overlap of near and far images. The halo effect is eliminated, but there is a trade-off. There is a decrease in the quality of vision and near vision is usually up to one diopters. These are some of the EDOF designs. Uh, like you can see there is a pinhole EDOF design, then there is a uh, hybrid multifocal refractive EDOF design. So there are different types of designs. And uh, the one which we are using most commonly, of course, is the uh, eye hands lens. Now, what if you compare EDOF versus uh, multifocals, uh, we know that uh, sometimes uh, one of the ways to compensate for the insufficiency in near visual acuity in patients with EDOF lenses is mini monovision or mix and match with diffractive low ad lenses should be considered. And using the mini monovision may cause decrease in far vision and additional halos from low myopia in the contralateral line. So this mix and match blended vision with multifocals and of IOLs is a uh, one of the you know promising treatment and maybe in the future this is what we will have to do for most of our patients. So it is one of the viable alternatives to a trifocal implantation. Uh, like with other IOLs, EDOFs also have problems. There can be a problem of neuroadaptation. Photic phenomenon will be there. The visual quality will also be compromised because we are uh, extending the depth of focus, right? And then we come to the trifocal IOLs. The trifocal IOLs actually provide an intermediate focal points in addition to near and distance focus. Now, in this trifocal, the, the height of the steps is altered in a... Uh, is, uh, is varied in an alternating fashion. So there are some uh, steps which have a higher height and there are some, some steps which have a lower height. So there's alternation of the heights. And uh, this pattern has an effect of creating three different orders. The first order, the zero order, the first order and the second order corresponding to distance, intermediate and near foci. 
So if this is a comparison between different trifocal lenses, uh, the accuracy of panoptics, fine vision, ATLISA, and the technic synergy. So we know that um, uh, most of them are using the diffractive, except the Actusoft also uses the diffractive refractive principle. And they are all apod uh, apod they, uh, all of them are non-apodized except the fine vision. Um, then the size of the haptics and the size of the optics is almost comparable in all, in all of them. Todic is also available in all of them. So the performance is also comparable in most of these lenses. Now, a few studies. Uh, this study basically compares the performance of Technic Synergy versus Actress of Panoptics Multifocal. And uh, we know that the, the both these lenses are considered to be very high premium lenses. They are used a lot in our practice. Now, we have seen that uh, although not uh, statistically significant, the Actress of Panoptics uh, demonstrated better um, uncorrected distance visual acuity and uncorrected intermediate visual acuity sooner post-operatively compared to the synergy which uh, shows better uncorrected near visual acuity at three and six months. So synergy patients, uh, it was seen that they took a little time to improve their vision compared to the panoptics patients. And then this is another study which uh, has compared the uh, trifocal or hybrid multifocal EDOF lenses and uh, uh, we have seen that in this uh, group, the halo photic effect was generated most commonly by the trifocal lens and contrast sensitivity, subjective visual quality had comparable results between the groups. Trifocal lens performed better at near distance, but led to more photic disturbances compared to the EDOF lenses. So the panoptics, now a little bit about the different, uh, you know, branded IOLs and each one of these IOLs like panoptics, synergy, uh, Hoya, these are the commonly used ones. Each one has some patented technology and that is what they, they are using to promote or, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, 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 tell us the advantages and disadvantages of each of these lenses. So the Panoptics uh, has a has four foci design, okay, and it uses a proprietary optical technology called Enlighten. It distributes the focal point uh, at 120 centimeters to the distance focal for amplified vision. And uh, there are three foci distance intermediate at 60 centimeters. Distance is infinity intermediate at 60 centimeters and near at 40 centimeters. It is a non-apodized 4.5 millimeters diffractive zone. It allows high utilization and transmits 88% of the light to the retina at a three millimeter pupil size, provides optimized performance in a wide range of lighting conditions. Uh, so there is a, a high distribution of light for uh, distance, especially in small pupil. That is uh, why it is uh, supposed to have less of this photic phenomenon. Now, the panoptics clarion is also an advancement of panoptics only, but it is supposed to be glistening free, which was uh, one of the problems which was seen in uh, the Alcon lenses. So, the panoptics clarion and all the clarion range of lenses is supposed to be uh, glistening free. Then another brand of uh, IOLs which are commonly used is the Zeiss lens. Uh, Zeiss is uh, uh, it's a hydrophilic acrylic lens, but it has a hydrophobic surface properties. Okay, and uh, it, it it's supposed to have a very good uh, uh, you know fixation because there are four point haptic fixation, and it is a one point eight millimeter uh, lens. So it has uh, three sixty degrees anti PCO sharp edges, and uh, negative spherical aberration lenses. Another uh, patented technology which they have is that uh, these in the diffraction steps, the conventional IOLs have a lot of artifacts, but Zeiss has a patented SMP design, uh, sorry, which claims that the artifacts are less. So there is less, uh, you know, uh, splitting of light or diffraction of light at these uh, edges. Uh, Technis eye hands uh, is a uh, EDOF lens, which uses an intermediate vision. Uh, it provides uh, good intermediate vision compared to a spheric monofocal level. And it uses a, a higher order A sphere and creates a continuous power profile. And it, inter it delivers intermediate vision with a monofocal lens for the first time. Technic Synergy also we know it's a trifocal lens and it also has some intermediate uh, characteristics. So it is a hybrid EDOF trifocal lens. Alcon VVT is an EDOF lens and it also uh, is, it has, it is on the Clarion platform. So it is supposed to be glistening free. 
Now, another new concept is the Hoya geometric pairing lenses. Now, the Hoya Vivinex uh, comes in two uh, varieties, the Hoya Vivinex geometric, which is more dominant for distance, and the Vivinex geometric plus, which is more dominant for near distance. So this is, again, it's a, uh, you know, a, a example of pairing of lenses, where we uh, counsel the patient that, you know, both eyes will have to be done. And we first uh, use, put the dominant uh, do the dominant eye and we uh, put the geometric lens and we see how much is the vision and then according to that we plan the other eye in which we can put the geometric plus. So this is uh, I think uh, quite a futuristic plan because now the uh, even the IOL manufacturers have kind of said that you know it is difficult to predict the uh, vision binocularly in patients with the same IOL in both eyes so we must uh, explain this option of pairing of lenses in the two eyes. So a lot about uh, multifocal and trifocal. Now we come to another very, very important part that is the toric IOLs. And uh, toric IOLs uh, have become like, you know, uh, uh, I think almost uh, every OT will have a few toric IOLs because a large percentage of patients will have high astigmatism, more than three diopters. And although we can use limbal relaxing incisions or clear opposite clear corneal incisions, but toric IOLs are really a very good method of or uh, you know, uh, taking care of the astigmatism. So now indications is a few things about the indications. Uh, uh, regular astigmatism is a good indication. Non-progressive keratoconus is also indication. Post PK patients who have stable uh, astigmatism uh, and uh, peripheral corneal scars, which are uh, not affecting the central vision. And the contraindications are any patient with a history of trauma, developmental anomaly, inflamed eye with the presence of synechia, any patients where we anticipate a complicated cataract surgery or a patient with a large angle alpha. These are the cases where we should not consider toric. Now, we all know that uh, toric implantation, we have to measure the posterior corneal astigmatism, uh, which is done with the help of Scheinflug's um, uh, imaging and uh, with the help of shine flux we can because the posterior corneal astigmatism has an effect on the total astigmatism and it's very important and all the uh, toric calculators also take this into account also the surgically induced astigmatism as the incision size keeps on decreasing the surgically induced astigmatism has also decreased significantly the iol calculation uh, of using the biometer is very important and these days we have very good optical uh, biometers which can uh, perform very accurate iol power calculation to make uh, the uh, calculation uh, more efficient, we use a toric calculator. Some of them are available online or even the toric oil manufacturers will do the calculation for you. The preoperative marking uh, using a, a bubble marker, uh, using femtolaser or uh, intraoperative callisto marking will really help in uh, accurate positioning of the lens and a good uh, cortical wash and a round central rexus. So in, I think in these cases, the importance of femto laser assisted cataract surgery uh, is again and again reiterated that this will really make, uh, you know, the implantation of a premium IOL so much more easier and predictable. A little bit about IOL glistenings. Of course, this this is uh, basically, uh, we, uh, glistenings used to be very common in hydrophobic IOLs and they appeared as a kind of matting, matte texture of the uh, lens and uh, why it is important now most IOLs, uh, premium IOLs are uh, supposed to be glistening free. Okay, now this glistening ha happens because of the phase separation of water within the hydrophobic acrylic IOLs and they have been reported in the uh, central as well as in the peripheral area and there are different gradings of glistenings. They cause uh, reduced vision, glare, halos and decreased contrast. The Clarion lenses and Invista lenses, they claim to be glistening free because the water content has been increased and is uniformly distributed. Um, these newer lenses, I think uh, we have already discussed about the pinhole lenses and there is one more clear view. Then a little bit about light adjustable IOLs. Uh, this is a very, very uh, new and interesting uh, principle. And what happens is in this, there are some photosensitive molecules which are embedded in a silicon matrix. And when light is directed to a specific area of the lens, uh, there is a polymerization of these molecules and it polymerization creates a concentration gradient between the irradiated and the rest of the optic. So over a 12 hour period, the diffusion of the unexposed macromers will take place and it will cause a highly predictable change in the lens shape. And depending on whether we want a, a hyperopic or a myopic correction, we can uh, use irradiate the center or the periphery of the lens and then we lock it in. Okay. And so in that way, we can uh, change the power of the lens 
after it has been implanted. So it is a very futuristic and promising new technology for uh, premium IOLs. Of course, there are some contraindications, patients who have some herpetic disease, macular disease, or they have a history of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, using drugs which increase sensitivity to UV light. These patients are not suitable candidates. A uh, word about mini monovision. Uh, here, the do dominant eye is corrected for distance and the non-dominant eye is corrected for near to mid vision. The mini monovision amount of correction is 0 0.75 to 1.75. And uh, pseudophagic mini -mo monovision most commonly uses eye hands or EDOF IOLs. And uh, this may be a very promising uh, you know, method of treatment in patients who are not able to afford a, a premium IOL, a trifocal IOL, or they have some uh, ocular comorbidity, like they have uh, maybe uh, advanced uh, glaucoma or they have some retinal pathology, and still they desire spectacle independence. And it could be like a mix and match uh, approach, like bilateral myopic monovision. We implant a monofocal IOL targeting 0.5 in dominant and minus 1.25 in the non-dominant. Or it could be hybrid, like you put a trifocal in the non-dominant and a monofocal in the dominant. So different mix and match uh, can be done. But I think the safest is to put a EDOF lens in both eyes, uh, uh, correcting the dominant for distance and the uh, non-dominant for near. Then there are some future uh, research uh, IOLs which are taking place where we can customize the asphericity of the IOLs, especially in patients who have had previous refractive surgery. So it is not that the same aspheric IOL will work for every patient, but a customized aspheric IOL may be a futuristic uh, proposition of uh, IOL. And then there is a transitional focus IOLs where uh, there is a continuous full range of vision and there are transition zones. So it provides a smooth transition from near to infinity to intermediate. And these lenses are also supposed to be forgiving for some degree of tilt and decentration. So uh, to conclude, uh, we have seen that the whole a gamut of changes which have taken place in IOLs right from the first IOL and uh, over six, uh, I think 70 years have passed and there's a continuous progression and I think every year will bring us more and more newer IOLs and uh, EDOF IOLs I consider is a big uh, game changer in this uh, field and also trifocal EDOF combination IOLs and also lenses which are pairing of lenses, monovision and micro monovision. So with so many options in, in our uh, hands, we should be able to, you know, do our best, give our patients the best options uh, and, uh, you know, so that they can have a very good quality of vision postoperatively. So thank you uh, for your patient listening. Thank you, ma'am. That was a really comprehensive class. And you managed to cover such a big topic in such a short span of time. That is commendable. Sir, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, yeah it, I think so. Uh, it's a really uh, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, I think so Dr. Jaita has... Uh, covered all the uh, all parts of uh, means uh, IOLs uh, what we are putting and uh, I think so all peculiarities of the lenses also and uh, all contraindications indications and everything related to that it has been covered uh, excellent presentation Dr. Jaita thank you and, sir thank you uh, I think uh, all the students those who are hearing this uh, they have gained a lot of knowledge about it and uh, I think so very very minor and very uh, small peculiarities of the lenses they have been also they have been also uh, gathered uh, in this talk so very very nice talk very nice talk very good um, and uh -huh. I think so Dr. Pranitha any uh, questions they want to ask yes, yes sir. we have some students who will have some questions to ask so uh, I would like to welcome our two students uh, connected here Dr. Anmol Kar she is a postgraduate at uh, Ames Bhuvaneshwar and we have Dr. Shreya, who is a postgraduate in Ames Rishikesh. Both of them are here and uh, we welcome you to the class. Dr. Anmol, do you have any questions to ask? You'll have to unmute yourself. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Um, no, ma'am, no such talks. No, no questions. Okay, Dr. Shreya. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shreya. Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, what would be the cutoff for corneal astigmatism for toric IOLs? Uh, ma'am, would you like to answer that? Dr. Jaita, ma'am. Yeah, I think um, 
uh most of the manufacturers i think they manufacture tori kaiwals up to 5 6 adapters you can get uh, uh, the tori kaiwals from the manufacturers so uh, if you have a patient i think up to 3 to 4 adapters you can successfully uh, treat with uh, ma'am minimum i think what she is trying to ask is minimum uh, cut off minimum. okay minimum minimum cut off minimum i think yeah at least uh, 1.5 1 to 1 1.5 if you are using femto laser or you can uh, even one adapter, you can use LRIs to treat that uh, amount of astigmatism. So uh, more than one or 1.5, definitely go for a toric. 1.5 should be reasonable. Yeah, yeah. different so, subjects. Um, yes, sir. Anything you would like to present, say? present scenario, those who are having a femto, femto cataract uh, or a femto laser technology uh, with the double arcuate incisions also, uh, 1.5 astigmatism, they can be corrected. But um, if they, they don't have a femto cataract, then I think so 1.25. Because nowadays, the all these vendors, all these companies, they are coming with a lower astigmatism lenses also. So they are providing, uh, I think so, uh, Johnson & Johnson and other companies also. Yeah, 0 0.7, 0 0.75 or a one diopter astigmatism is also corrected by the uh, this toric lenses. So uh, we can have a that choice also with us. I think it is the surgeon's preference. So the uh, cutoff varies. There's no specific cutoff. Usually one adapter is what is, uh, you know, recommend, is, uh, written in textbooks that you go above one adapter, then go for toric. But uh, with opposite clear corneal incisions, if, if you don't have an, uh, access to femto, and with uh, LRIs or arcuate incisions, if you have an access to femto, you can correct extramatism even up to 1 or 1.25. And if you don't have and don't want to go with these options because these are not very predictable compared to torics, which are very predictable, even a low cut of 0.7 or 0.8 is considered by some surgeons. So it varies from surgeon to surgeon. Okay. Right. Yeah. And uh, a few more things that uh, as postgraduates that you need to know is that you need to look at the biometry very well before you're planning any patient for premium mile, say toric or multifocal. And uh, you have to have a look at the biometry in advance and discuss with the patient as to what the findings are and have a look at the patient on the slit lamp. Look for any corneal scar, rule out dry eye, and then only plan such patients. And always do a double check, do a repeat biometry. Be sure of your eye will power before you're going to implant any premium eye will in uh, patients because these are very demanding patients. You go wrong by even 0.25 or 0.5 diapters, they are going to be after your life. So be double sure of your findings, both your biometry and the patient's ocular finding before you make such calculations. I just want to ask uh, Dr. Jaita, uh, which are the uh, optical and uh, uh, this uh, immersion biometry uh, she is using for all these uh, premium IOLs, Dr. Jaita? So we are using uh, IOL Master. IOL Master 700, I think, uh, yeah, is what I'm yeah. using. We are going only with... So, uh, I will master 700 or do you uh, correlate with the uh, uh, immersion biometry also? No, sir. We are not doing immersion unless uh, this is a mad cat or something, mature cat rag, not uh, getting the axial length captured. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dense PSC or dense cat rag not getting captured. Not getting captured in the IOL 700. So, just one uh, one question, uh, one uh, my query. That is IOL master 700 uh, for uh, trifocal lenses uh, like... Uh, a synergy or a, a spatially trifocals of all this refractive variety. Uh, you go for a first hypermetropia or you go for a, a, a emetropia, Dr. Jaira? Sir, synergy, I think uh, the uh, we go for first hypermetropia for synergy. For other trifocals, we go for emetropia. You're going for the emetropia? Okay. Yeah. I think oh, that's one okay. thing peculiar about synergy from rest of the all other multifocal yeah. items. Exactly. So, uh, how much first hypermetropia? Like 125? The first, yeah. The first hyper, just after emetropia. So, I think it, it really helps if you're in discussion with the uh, manufacturers because they will uh, also give you a lot of inputs and yeah. uh, recheck. Uh, sometimes even for toric, you know, you, you can get them to recheck and they will suggest which is the best toric option because they will give you two, three toric options and then you can uh, kind of choose the one which is best for you. Uh, okay. You can titrate uh, the uh, residual astigmatism as well as your incision location to get the best results. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, one question. 
yes yes please do please do uh, which are to prefer in post classic cases and how to calculate the power dr jayita uh, sir would you like to answer that that is a separate we, we have actually <laughs> had a class, uh, we have had a class in each yeah uh, dr mantri has covered uh, cataract uh, il bar calculation and special situation mm -hmm. you can refer back to i think it was episode 6 of cataract modules you can refer back to that class because oh, it's a yeah. long topic to be covered yeah okay. because of all formulations and all yes. calculation formulas and there are different formulas for calculating in which all everything has been covered in detail for post refractive and keratoconus and post keratoplasty everything has been covered there yeah okay. so that's a different topic to uh, cover up there uh, but, but um, uh, very interesting uh, topic i think so all students they should know also that uh, what dr jayita has covered is a mini monovision and a mix and match monovision that is a very really interesting topic and uh, nowadays uh, when there is a cataract is not only the cataract surgery it is a cataract refractive surgery so uh, in this uh, era when patients are coming for the uh, specially uh, perfect hematropia i think so this combination also works very well uh, when you combine two uh, different types of the iols like edof and uh, trifocal lenses or a two edof lenses uh, two uh, multifocals and trifocals lenses so sometimes these all but very carefully you have to uh, counsel right. the patients mm -hmm. that is very important i think right and okay. also what uh, most post graduates forget is that the a constant for all these iols is different so whenever you're choosing and picking up one specific iol do your biometry with an a constant adjusted for that specific iol so that you don't you know over correct or under correct because you know a lot of time post graduates forget harbani mein they do calculations they forget to change the model or the iol that you are selecting mm -hmm. and an a constant changing by even 0.4 0.5 is going to make a hell lot of a change mm -hmm. in the visual outcome that the patient will have mm -hmm. so choose the right a constant when you are making your il pass a very important i think so one one part is that uh, surgically induced astigmatism mm -hmm. sia is also very important that what amount of sia you are putting in the formula toric calculation formula because sometimes we are putting you are putting 0.5 and you are putting 0.25 that also makes a lot of difference in a uh, uh, calculating uh, that iol power also uh, okay. it makes a difference in uh, uh, that uh, calculation so i think uh, all students they should know and very important don't uh, be in a hurry when you are doing a calculation formulas because sometimes you are putting a steep k and a flat k to a sway then there will be a so much uh, going to be chaos in your Okay, and as you asked about the cut off for toric iol, also it is important to understand that uh, at the incision where you are going to place the sur surgeon's incision, the main port makes a difference on the final astigmatism that the patient will have. So, in case the patient has a vertical steep axis and has say a point seven point seven five astigmatism, and you are prone to doing temporal surgeries, you are going to actually increase the astigmatism for the patient. so the cut off will also vary based on which uh, incision site you are comfortable with and which axis is steep for the patient so do look into all these things right. when you are planning a patient for premium eyes i think so in the initial clinical practice is what we have practiced is that in the toric iols uh, we do dilate the patients at one week interval or when patients are coming at a five days or a one week interval just to see that whether the iol which has been put at the particular axis is there or not yes. because sometimes there is a rotation of the iol and if you are not sure enough that the iol is rotated or uh, if it is not in the proper place then you can take patient sec uh, for the uh, again for the rotation so i think uh, that practice in the initial phase you can practice it out and then when you are sure enough then it's okay otherwise that can be the good way to see that uh i will is properly placed or not dr anmol have you seen any toric iol implantations at your hospital yes ma'am okay so how do you assess the post op axis of the iol post operatively with a slit lamp uh, uh, making a slit and then uh, marking the angle so with the axis uh, you with the uh, rotation of the uh, slit beam you can yes. actually measure the angles are marked on the uh, slit lamp slit so with lamp. the you can actually measure yes okay
okay good any other questions dr anmol dr shreya you want to ask no ma'am okay sir any more comments from your side yeah it's a uh, i think it's a very good uh, topic and uh, nowadays uh, uh, when we are getting some surprises also uh, very important uh, is I, i just want to ask dr data that uh, uh, how do you tackle when they are coming to you say for example some defective surprise or uh, when there is some uh, patients are coming with uh, uh, some cylindrical surprise in toric patients or uh, some surprise in uh, trifocals or like that how do you tackle it or how do you see sir, and then what will be your uh, plan or treatment sir uh, i am very conservative i would uh, try to explain to the patient that even before uh, counseling you know we i always tell that it is not that we are promising a patient total uh, independence from spectacles and it, sometimes they may need it's a small uh, refractive error then use glasses okay or uh, you know when we are doing one eye and then we get a little bit of refractive error in that then we uh, you kind of uh, other eye we can plan accordingly uh, so that the both eyes will balance out each other and uh, they will have a continuous range of vision for near intermediate as well as distance uh, so these things do happen but i am uh, until uh, the patient you know really uh, is adamant that you do something i, I would not really explant a lens or i think bioptics is a good option for uh, doing a laser top laser top up prk uh, prk or something that is also a good option it, uh, for some patients we, which we can consider but removing the lens and putting another lens is i feel it's quite traumatic it is not necessary most patients will understand there will be one patient maybe who is really adamant but if you explain all the risks and complications of a second surgery most patients will understand and over a period of time also we, i think we must tell them that these lenses like uh, especially synergy takes time so it may take uh, maybe 6 to 8 weeks also for the patient to get his uh, full uh, you know range of vision mm -hmm. so patient has to be uh, patient has to be patient and trust the doctor and <laughs> which is not always the situation it is not always <laughs> <laughs> the doctor also has to be patient so don't jump into yeah uh, doing right. a second surgery so mostly all patients are some complaining of positive dysphotopsia this is a very common complaint mm -hmm. of patients mm -hmm. temporal side there is mm -hmm. some these are very common complaint of patients mostly they are they have very annoying symptoms on the temporal mm -hmm. side of because yeah, i think sometimes you know because we have so many patients to see we we kind of spend less time on the counseling and the pre op workup of a pre myel patient and we sometimes even don't know that this patient will go for a pre myel when we see the patient in obd and later on on the day of the surgery you see that this patient has come for synergy or panoptic something then you will say oh i mean i didn't check the tears of this patient charmers test nahi kiya or we didn't check the angle cup so uh, th these things you know um, and then the patient has come for surgery has already paid a huge amount of money and uh, the patients are according to the patient is taken into the ot and you, you think well with this is this patient really suitable for this lens this might happen so uh, yeah so uh, spends i think we should all get into the habit of spending enough time with the patient taking the patient into your confidence and reassurance most patients uh, over a period of time they will understand and uh, unless the patient and very demanding very exacting patients uh, may not be good candidates for um, trifocals yeah, yeah, exactly. then now 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 is so we have a very good option of speed of lenses mm. so speed of is a good option for these option. patients yeah absolutely i think so uh, in my practice i have found out that with the vvt lenses by uh, uh, implanted bilaterally patients are getting very good at six mm -hmm. vision mm -hmm. they are happy without uh, spectacles also mm -hmm. so, i think uh, that works very well okay. with the uh, ihs lens also with the correction mm -hmm. of 1.5 or 1.25 mm -hmm. they are very they are good happy patients actually so it doctor has uh, solved out that problem of trifocal uh, who mm -hmm. were contraindicated for trifocals right i think we have had a great discussion thank you uh, ma'am and thank you parish sir for uh, the uh, time for your time and uh, for the wonderful presentation ma'am thank I you think, uh, with that we have come to the end of this session and at the end of the session i would like to invite all our viewers and the students 
to the physical eye focus uh, that Dr. Santosh Navar has been organizing since over a decade now. And uh, we have the physical eye focus uh, being organized in the month of June from 9 to 16 in Hyderabad this year. And uh, so you can register for this course. The uh, pre-registration is required. 300 uh, candidates can be registered. So if you're interested, please go ahead and register. The link for registration is at the bottom of the screen. And you can go ahead and register for these very interesting classes where we'll, there'll be didactic sessions of lectures as well as hands-on training. With that, we come to an end of this session. Thank so, you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Pranita. Thank you, Dr. Jaita and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pranita. Join.